Well, what a great day for Twins baseball as Joe Maurer is now among baseball's immortals. And joining us now to talk a little more about what he has accomplished here is, I think I could call you his best friend, uh, Justin Morneau, <laughs> who was his partner in crime for so many seasons with the Twins. And uh, you have to be elated to see Joe get honored like this. Yeah, I think it was a question heading into it. What did the voters see? You know, what do they, you never really know how they're going to react. And I think they reacted in the right way because he is a Hall of Famer. He's a guy that when he was on the field, he was the best athlete. He was the best player and he was the best catcher in the game for a long time. So I think he did things that no one else did in the history of the game. The three batting titles, I mean, he led the all-star game in voting for a kid from the Midwest. It's, it's incredible what he did as a player. And I think the voters recognize that. All right, uh, let's go back to the beginning. You were there two years before him, and then he came in as an 18-year-old, and I was looking through some old newspaper articles, and you guys apparently went to a sporting goods store? <laughs> yeah, our, our first meeting we went to, uh, I think it was a Dick Sports down in, uh, in Fort Myers, and we knew we were going to be friends when we just started picking up hockey sticks and, and basketballs and just started, you know, playing in the aisles of uh, the Dick Sporting Goods down there in Fort Myers. And, and uh, not a whole lot was said, you know, knowing the two of us, it was, it was pretty quiet, but uh, we knew that uh, we could pick up any, any, uh, anything in that sporting goods store and we were going to try and compete. We were going to have fun. And, and uh, you know, that's kind of how it all started. All right. So you see him then, what was your impressions of his baseball talents? I mean, were you, awestruck back then or is this a process that he went through to become a hall of famer what did you notice in joe that made him stand out more than anybody else well i think you know in the minor leagues there's there's so much that's put on a first rounder anytime there's a first rounder on the field whether it's on your team or the other team everybody knows so you, there's always eyes on that person and and then you sit there and you, if you weren't a first round pick you look and you go well, how is that guy that much better than everyone else? And you could see it immediately with Joe. You could see it with the athleticism. I remember in his first big league camp, you know, we we're sitting there and I was at first base and he was catching and, and he picks up a ball and he throws it to first. And I, I'm kind of thinking as, as he's throwing the ball, why isn't he really trying? It doesn't really look like he's putting a whole lot of effort in. And all of a sudden the ball caught me. I mean, it, it took me back and I almost hit me square in the chest. And, and I think that's kind of how it was for him. He just made it look so easy because he was just so athletic, he was so talented, and you could tell when he was on the field that he was always the best athlete, no matter what age, no matter who he was out there with, even as an 18-year-old kid, you could tell that there was something special there, and, and it translated into him having a Hall of Fame career. And you look at what he did to prepare himself. He just didn't live off natural ability. I mean, I'd see some of it, obviously very little of it, but I could see just how intense his workout was and his regiment was every day to get ready for every single ball game. He never cut corners. I mean, he didn't say, ah, I'm good enough today. I'll, I'll be able to get through it. He put maximum effort in day after day after day. Yeah, I think, you know, that the knee injury he sustained his rookie year, he had a routine that he had to stick to and he knew that he needed to do it. And he never wavered from that routine. He knew exactly what he needed to do day in, day out, every single day to prepare to get himself on the field every chance he could because he knew if he didn't do that, his career wasn't going to last as long as he wanted it to. And you know, Very few of us get to walk away at the end of the day and decide when our career is over. Usually it's somebody in the front office you know, makes that decision <laughs> for you. And, and he was one of the lucky ones because of the way he prepared and the way he took care of himself. And you know, it was incredible to see. Uh, number one, I've never seen anyone sleep the way he did. I mean, he was... He could sleep for 12 hours a night, no problem. So I think that was part of, you know, his recovery and, and his routine. But, I mean, he was so dedicated in what he was doing. His only focus was on being the best baseball player he could. There were so many distractions that were available to him, being, you know, a kid playing for his hometown team with so many family and friends around. But he took care of that stuff in a certain way. But then when it was time to get to the field and time to put in the work, he put in the amount of work that he needed to do to make himself a Hall of Famer. And I want to touch on that more because that really is something that gets overlooked. Some say, oh, it's great playing in your hometown. It put more pressure on him, more of a spotlight on him. Every single day, he had to be Joe Maurer, and he had to be the guy for everyone. How difficult was that for him to perform and deal with that 
intense spotlight day after day? Well, I think it started when he was in high school. You know, he always knew when he was in the spotlight. He always, you can always tell when there's eyes on you. And I think the eyes were always on him, no matter where he went. I mean, it was hard to, hard for him to hide as well with those sideburns he had, especially <laughs> when he was a young kid. You know, there was, there was no hiding as Joe Maurer as a kid in, in Minnesota. So, you know, he was, he was a guy that was always aware, but then at the same time, he treated everyone with respect. There was not an interaction that I saw where somebody came up and said, you know, Joe, hey, I know your cousin from so-and-so, and, and then they would go into this story. And every single time he would give them the attention that it deserved, and, and every single time it felt like that person walked away satisfied with that interaction. When it, it can be so difficult when you're always on and you're always expected to be, you know, the, the friendly hometown kid, and you're not really ever allowed to have a bad day because one bad interaction ends up spreading like wildfire. And, and I never saw that happen. Anytime I was with him, uh, I actually loved going places with him because I could go and be left alone and everybody would go over to Joe and I could go over and, and have a beer over at the bar or whatever I needed to do. So, you know, it was, it was, it was great. But at the same time, I don't know how he handled it, but he handled it so well. And, and I think, you know, obviously the upbringing, his parents, his grandparents, having family around, having friends to keep him grounded, to remind him that he's just a kid from St. Paul and then they never let him, you know, get too big for, for who he was. And he never, never let himself get too big for, and never forgot where he came from. Well, how did he handle that pressure? Because you guys were roommates, I think, in 06. You guys shared a, a condo. And so, you know, there obviously was a lot of conversations and spring trainings and bus rides and plane rides. How did he handle that pressure? Were there times when he was like, God, I almost wish I played in New York as opposed to the Twin Cities? Not once did I ever hear him complain about the attention or, you know, the fact that he was playing in his hometown. You know, at the end of his career, there was a talk. You know, the team was struggling. He was, you know, getting towards the end, hadn't won that World Series. You know, there was opportunities maybe for him to go to somewhere like Boston or, or somewhere where there was a chance for a team. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned to him once, and he shot that down immediately. There was no thought of him ever wanting to play anywhere else. He got to, he knew how special it was to get to play for his hometown team, the team that he grew up cheering for, the guys he grew up idolizing, and, and, and Kirby Puckett and, and Herbie and, and all these guys that, you know, he, he saw what it meant to play for the Minnesota Twins, and he never took that for granted. And I think he just handled it so well because he understood it was a privilege to be able to play for your hometown team in front of your family and friends. All right, let's get into the, the batting and the, the batting titles. What were those years like for him? What made him so dynamic at the plate? Was he studying opposing pitchers? Was it because he was a catcher? He had, had more looks at, at pitches all the time? Or... What do you think was one of the keys for his success at the plate and winning those batting titles? Well, I think it's a combination of all those things. I mean, his preparation was obviously elite. He understood exactly what he wanted to do when he got in the batter's box, and his pitch recognition and his strike zone knowledge were better than anyone I've ever seen. You know, he never seemed like he was off balance. He never seemed like he was chasing pitches. You know, you'd see other guys flailing and, and falling over and taking off balance swings. It never seemed like he missed the barrel also. I mean, he would go years. I think there was one year where he said he broke three bats. I remember there was games where I broke three bats. So, I mean, it, it was just it was just special. He'd wear out bats before he'd actually miss the barrel enough to, for the bat to break. So, And he was one of the last guys to swing an ash bat. So those things are easier to break. You hit them anywhere off the barrel, and you splinter them towards the handle, or, you, you know, you, you see him break. And you never saw him really take those, those awkward off-balance swings. You never saw him chase too much and, and i think obviously the guys hitting around him benefited from that he, t he saw a ton of pitches he was on base a ton which helped you know the guys myself and, and cuddy and tory and the guys who hit behind him you know come up there with runners on base and the pitcher always had to be concerned with base runners and then you know running deep counts running pitch counts up i mean he just did everything so well that he made it look easy and i think the one thing that i think that for me that got overlooked was his competitiveness i think you know, because he was so even keeled on the field, because he never seen, you never saw him really snap. You never saw him lose his, his temper, but hit, there was a deep fire in there. You know, being the youngest of the three brothers, being a guy always having to fight to keep up with, with, with Jake and Billy that, you know, there was a, there was a burning competitiveness in there. He hated to lose. You know, he, he always wanted to, to be the guy going out there at the end of the day. If we didn't win, he didn't care if he, if he had three hits, it, it, it didn't matter to him. The only thing that really mattered was trying to win ball games. And I think, that to me is something that I think that doesn't get talked about enough. You know, from those guys, from from those of us, especially me, being around them a lot, 
knowing what winning meant to him and, and the years making the playoffs and the years we didn't, you know, it, it was just something that he, he competed every at bat. He prepared every single day, he prepared the same way every day. And he went out there and it led to a long hall of fame career. Explain a little bit how the catching aspect piled on to the workload and what he did to have the success at the plate still while doing all of that and making sure the pitchers were set. You know, it wasn't just about his coming up to the plate, his at bats. He had so much on his plate and the physical toll that that takes because you were a catcher as well back in the beginning. Yeah, I think that's the other part that maybe is overlooked a little bit is, is the fact that a catcher is a defense is a defense first position. You know, you have to go out there, you have to prepare your guy, you have to know how you're going to approach each hitter for the other team. How are we going to pitch to these guys? Where where do we match up our pitcher's strengths? And then having the ability to make adjustments throughout the game. You know, it, it's something that Joe talked about. He was a student of the game. He talked to Brad Radke a lot. And, and you know, he'll tell you that Brad Radke taught him a lot of lessons when he was a young catcher. And I think also, I think Terry Ryan and, and the front office did a good job of surrounding him with veteran catchers. You know, him and Mike Redman were a great <laughs> tandem. And also... You know, even Henry Blanco was there, and, and we had some other some other catchers, some veteran guys that really helped him along when he was young, what it meant to prepare on the defensive side, and the offense was almost secondary, and it was incredible. And maybe he didn't have a chance to overthink it like some of us did where he was so <laughs> focused on, you know, how am I going to get my pitcher through this through this inning? How am I going to get my pitcher into the sixth inning when he doesn't have his best stuff? That he would go up there and, and you know, two, three line drives, find himself on base, and then get back behind the plate. But, you know, I think – the, off, uh, the defensive side, especially before there was so much analytics and there was so much information presented to you, he had to figure a lot of that stuff out on his own. And the game plan was there with Rick Anderson, you know, with pitching coaches and, and with the other catchers. And they would sit down there before the game when the rest of us are, are eating a sandwich or are in the cage hitting. <laughs> he was thinking about how am we going to get my guy through the game today? And I think the defensive side, the gold gloves were there. He was a phenomenal catcher. He was a tremendous, you know, pitch framer, pitch blocker. He had a tremendous arm. I mean, he could do everything you'd want a catcher to do, and then you add the offense on top of it. I think that's what makes him elite, and that's what makes him all of him. Last question for you, Justin. Do you think Minnesota really understands, do you think fans really understand what a special player he was? I think those of a certain age that got to see those teams, I mean, it was, it was a combination of so many things, right? We had gold glove center fielder. We had gold glove fielders around the field. We had a Cy Young winner on the mound. We had one of the best closers in the history of the game. We had teams that were going to the playoffs consistently or battling to go to the playoffs. And I think and then you had Joe behind the plate. And I think if he was the only guy on a bad team year after year, I think people, he would have stood out a lot more than he did. And I think, you know, people that got to see him catch and they got to see him when he was the best player and one of the best players in the history of the game, what he was able to do behind the plate, I think, there's certain age of, of people now that didn't get a chance to see him, you know, towards the end of his career, he moved to first base. The injuries forced him off of catching, but there was a time when, you know, you looked out on the field and there was a lot of good players. There was all stars and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of talent on our teams and he was still the best player out there. And I think, you know, players recognize that when you're standing on the field, you kind of all know who the alpha male is, right? You look out there and you go, we're all pretty good but that guy's just a little bit better than the rest of us. And I think that's kind of the respect that he had from his teammates. And I think there's a lot of fans that do understand it, what he meant to this team and to this organization and, and to this area of baseball fans. And I think uh, he's getting his due you know, recognition and, and we're all so proud and so happy for him. Yeah, no doubt about it. There was one thing you forgot though. You mentioned off the center fielder and the pitcher. They had a hell of a first baseman back then too. Uh, he came up with the guy on base about 40% of the time. So <laughs> <laughs> he was a beneficiary of that guy hitting, hitting in front of him. Absolutely. Joe, we so happy for him. Justin, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to you on Twins Baseball this, this spring, this summer. And uh, let's hope they get back to the playoffs again. Sounds good. Win some more games. Appreciate it.